Hi you guys, this is Rosina Starr. Thank you for joining me. This is going to be kind of an emotional video because I'm going to share with you some things about my childhood that I'm um, kind of just ashamed of and I've never really gotten out there before. But I need everybody to know where I come from to understand where I'm at and how I can help people with what I've been through. I'm not telling this to be um, made fun of or judged, but it's maybe even somebody out there can relate to me because that's, I think, the key to loneliness is people don't feel like they're cared about and they don't feel like anyone can relate to them. And it's a tragic, it's a very tragic thing. So, here it goes. Starting from my childhood, my mother didn't really like me. I was in a private school and she was married to my dad. He was a Marine. She worked at the post office and then they both worked at the post office when he got out of the service. They moved into a nice place on the east side, just the average home. And my mom had two kids at the time, me and my older sister. She's a year and a half older than me. And my dad obviously had a drinking problem. My mother shared with me at a younger age that she didn't want to raise kids by herself and she just wanted to be with my dad because he was good looking. Um, I don't even think she really loved my father, but anyway, she realized it wasn't going to work on her honeymoon, which she mentioned. And she decided to want to stick it out anyways because I think it would make her feel more like a failure if she left. So, in my childhood, my mom was so consumed with trying to control my dad and keep up on the bills and him staying out late and avoiding her completely left her feeling all alone. And so then she would isolate more and more away from us girls at a young age. And she was like a drill sergeant and she ran the house kind of like a shelter, constantly bossing us around or... You know, just not validating us at all as children or really even wanting to acknowledge that we exist. Um, so, as we got older and we formed, you know, brains and minds of our own, that became more painful. As if childhood wasn't enough painful and I was put on Adderall in second grade. Actually, I was tested on a bunch of different ones. I ended up on Adderall at some point. But I was, um... Never allowed to express anything at home. No emotions, no any kind of joy, unless I was with my older sister. I mean, you couldn't uh, sexually explore yourself in teenage years. You could not have any kind of stuff in your drawers that proves you're a woman growing into one. Um, she would take it. Like, you, you weren't allowed to talk about certain topics. She just didn't want to hear it. Um, you weren't really allowed to, t to say, you know, disagree with her really at all. Because, you know, her way or the highway, right? So, she shuffled me around to two different uh, middle schools after she pulled me out of private school. It was the first mistake. She did it because of money, even though she could have afforded it. My older sister graduated from that private school and went on to high school which was a great place to go. It was a nice high school we went to in Janesville, Wisconsin. So I was shuffled around to middle schools and then I was molested in seventh grade. I didn't tell anybody about it. It was just a guy that was part of a group I was hanging out with. I hardly talked to the guy. It was just out of nowhere and I was always running late for class. I, I just, and he would always be right there. like. I think he was actually supposed to be in school suspension or something. I never saw him ever in a class. Some foster, you know, black guy, like 200 pounds. And so this is at the newer Marshall, because I went from Monroe, one school, to the old Marshall down by the library downtown, and then there was a newer one that was built. So I was at three different schools, a lot of jumping around. And then um, <clears throat> I was to take my medication every day and make sure that I took it, and my mom would regulate that through the therapist in Madison, Wisconsin, and we would go there once a month to make sure that I was heavily medicated and a good caged animal. And so 
I don't know. I lost a lot of weight. I didn't eat on Adderall really at all. Um, I just felt like I was a presence and not a person. Uh, things really didn't matter to me as much, but it's like when you didn't get enough sleep on Adderall, it's like you become delirious, so then everything was a big deal and you're just a crybaby like all the time. Um, and that's kind of what, I guess, pills or drugs will do to you, right? <laughs> but anyway, um, so, you know, having that burden of that guy, um, it's very awkward, you know, because all these girls were sexually active in seventh grade, and I really didn't do anything. I was a virgin, and I was honest about it, and nobody really believed me. They just kind of stood back and was like, yeah, right, and, you know, they're all, you know, mischievous people, you know, been to jail, just kind of ghetto, you know, baggy pants, wearing kind of crew, just no respect for anybody, uh, you know, kids at 16 years old, or have, you know, siblings that do have kids that are 16, and just, you know, real who cares kind of lifestyle, right? And uh, they seemed to be the people that gravitated me towards me the most. And so there was this girl named Lindsay in my middle school, and there was a girl named um, Ashley, we'll call her. And for some reason, they thought I was hitting on somebody's guy, and I wasn't. And she had warned me the day before about something, and I just said, I, I don't know what you're talking about. And I'm not the type to start, tra like, stuff with people. I mean, I just, I'm not the type of person. So without any further ado, the girl like knocked me out with both eyes and I fell to the ground. I didn't fight back. She was expelled from school for that, but there was no reason why that should have happened. And then I think my dad kind of stepped in to do something at that point to make sure nothing ever happened to me again, which was nice. So I guess that you could say I was picked on, which I would have been a bully. So it was just kind of um, out of nowhere. I can't believe this girl got off uh, hitting me in the face for no reason and leaving scars. But, you know, whatever the case was, I hope that it was worth it to her. Um, you know, that Lindsay girl, she still lives in my hometown. Uh, she doesn't talk anything about that stuff. Uh, it didn't really affect her. And that's why, you know, I really don't talk to her anymore because why would I? And why would I want to hear about those other people? They don't really matter to me, right? And so then seventh grade was awful because then in eighth grade, I was getting out of that group after that girl, you know, had it out hitting me or whatever the case was. And there was a guy named Adam that was just a part of that group. And there was a party one night over at his mom's house. And I snuck out to go there because my mom doesn't ever want me going out, you know, and I was probably a freshman in high school at this point. Um, but the, the molesting eventually stopped in seventh grade. Uh, I eventually blurted it out to my mom and we had a, a meeting with Dr. Keen at the middle school and the, it was just, he wasn't allowed to even go in the other areas of the school. Like he was just at a desk all day. So he was not able to touch me, um, after a certain point, I remember, but I was hated for telling on him. Oh my God. Then that whole crowd just turned against me. That's why I was out of it. Right. That's what happened because they said I was a liar and he wouldn't do that and oh my God and blah, blah, blah. And so I think maybe that was why I got knocked out was because of that guy touching me. And, I, you know, there was nothing there. I didn't want the guy, but she liked, she was white and I think she liked black guys. I think that's what it was. But anyway, you know, your brain doesn't remember every detail because you try to forget, right? I mean, I had to have stitches in my eyes. The girl hit me so hard. She wasn't even wearing rings. Talk about a thug, huh? Fucking thug-ass bitch. She was big, too. Anyway, I don't know. Um, so then we'll move on to high school in ninth grade. Uh, you know, we had to work as soon as we were able to. I had a best friend named Danielle, and she uh, branched off with the rich people. She lived uh, in one of the nicer areas of town where we live. And so then she just decided that um, she didn't really value our friendship after ninth or tenth grade. And she wanted to get in with different people, and those different people didn't really accept me. And they dressed different, uh, they were, you know, moms and dads had different jobs, didn't have the, the home life like I do, and it probably wasn't a good fit for me to be a part of that group. So I never really wanted to be a part of a group anyway, but then, um, you know, so that broke my heart when she left, and, you know, she probably didn't think twice about it. But that's what happens, right? You come and go. And then I had a high school boyfriend named Joe, and he cheated on me. 
in his car with, I think, numerous different people, a girl from actually Parker High School, I think her name was Taryn or something, and that broke my heart because I had a year and a half, two years with him that was, like, the first person I was really into, um, you know, thinking it would go long term or something, and it seemed like we had a lot in common. Um, today he has three babies, moms, and three kids. Does well for himself with money, but I think I dodged a bullet. And I'm not going backwards because my future isn't in the past. So, you know, he was just an arrogant person, it turned out, and let all the attention and stuff go to his head. And, you know, everybody loves Joe, whatever his name is. And um, I just wasn't into all that either. So then I kept to myself for a while. And, yeah, I went to this party, though, but th this Adam guy had raped me. He was supposedly in this crowd, this, this dark crowd of people, and I don't know why it happened, but it just happened at a party at his mom's one day that this girl, Angie and Melissa, my friends were over there, and it was just kind of out of nowhere, and I don't know why I was targeted, but maybe I'm just an easy target. And so that happened in middle school, high school-ish, and it, it was all I can remember is seeing him in high school and just having to sit in the same classroom as him and just feeling so filthy and disgusting. Like, it was just, I think I hadn't dealt with it then. And now I'm dealing with it, so it's it's going to go away and get better, right? It's got to get better. And so that was going on, and then, you know, my mom picked me up from the house after that happened, and they were like, you're, no, you're such a liar, you're not a virgin, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, everything that was true they said wasn't. You know, it was like these people just were not in my best interest, and I don't know why I just continued to hang around with people that obviously didn't like me and have my best interest in mind. But that's what Adderall and drugs will do to you, right? once again. You just don't have any judgment. It's not that you have bad or good judgment, you just have none. So, um, being a part of that ridiculousness in my childhood then, um, High school, my mom was a lot meaner at home. You know, I joined swim practice. She'd make us walk home from, you know, 8 or 9 o'clock. Uh, we'd get done with practice at swim class. She'd never pick us up. Um, any of us girls, we had to walk home. You know, it was good seven, eight blocks home. And after swimming pretty hard for two or three hours, it was pretty hard on me to, to go home and I could have a cold dinner sitting in a dim lit kitchen to eat. And then I had to do the dishes sometimes twice because they weren't done right the first time. And then I was um, told to shower and go to bed. Usually we could shower in the morning, but usually it was not allowed. And we were only allowed 10 minutes for a shower and she would time it. Um, and you weren't allowed to lock the door ever because if she needed something in that bathroom because it was only three bedroom, one bath, she needed to get in there. But if she was in the shower, it was locked out and there was all these, you know, double standards going on for her. So, um, yeah, anyways, me and my older sister shared a room because Rachel came along. She had a third child and then my, my older sister, we always were, you know, taking care of each other, hanging out. And my mom would lock us out for three or four hours at a time, you know, on weekends and stuff to run around the neighborhood. And, you know, uh, we were forced to, you know, go to other people's houses and stay sometimes because she didn't want us around. Um, you know, just she wouldn't even care where we were at. She just, you know, when we came home, we came home. I mean, she was that way with the cat and the animals that we'd own, too. And she let the animals go on, on purpose, just like maybe they wouldn't come back and then it would hurt us and she'd get her supply that way. I mean, it was just sick sick and very very sad and you know she'd make you go downstairs and clean out the litter box with tuna fish cans because she wouldn't even buy you a scoop she's so cheap um you know meanwhile all of her money went on figurines and crystal and you know brand new clothes for herself and um you know gun bears dolls collectibles antiques figurines madame alexander dolls stuff like that that's all my mom really cared about up you know new furniture uh, you know, just anything for the house, real estate. So anyways, uh, my mom and dad got divorced at a young age. I, I left this out. I'm going to flash backwards just for a minute. He won the lottery and, um, I'm not going to say how much it doesn't really matter. Um, and she bought herself a couple properties with that. He went to Vegas for a month. She came back and divorced him. He woke up for seven years and said, I'm going to win the lottery today, Rose. And he finally did. And she's like, oh, that's where I was waiting for. And then she divorced him right, right after that. Cause she didn't really want him anyway, and, you know, they didn't have a good marriage. She, she just was so, you know, feeling bad about everything all the time, and, you know, she didn't have any help. So, you know, it was always rush us off to kinder care in the morning. You know, you could never relax. She was always policing us around the house. She was always micromanaging what we were doing. 
Um, you know, it was just, you know, we were treated like we were just used tissues on the floor and she'd pick us up occasionally, you know, when she was sick of seeing us there. Um, you know, it never gave us any praise for accomplishments or something past a certain age because we could think for ourselves and narcissists don't like people that can think for themselves, do they? So then we get to high school and, you know, I broke up with that guy, Joe, flash forward again, and I'm just basically hanging out with this girl, Anna. And she is amazing to me. And, you know, her family was kind of like my family. It was like the first time I ever felt like I felt like I fit in with a family and a group of people that were actually somewhat like me. And I never complained about living there. I did actually live with her after high school and stuff like that. And, you know, we got real close in high school. I considered her one of my best friends. She was just awesome. And very, very pretty, you know, outgoing, kind, energy, awesome. Just everything was about her was awesome. So, um... You know, that was great at the time. And then I had a car accident and she was the one that, you know, volunteered to pick me up and we had a great time and give her gas money sometimes and stuff and chip in, but she didn't really need it. And, you know, she she was just a, you know, a big hearted, kind uh, girl. Um, you know, I don't know her much today, but I know back then she was really somebody that was an awesome friend. And um, I do miss her. Anyway, moving along, um, in high school, then my senior year, you know, everything was kind of going, you know, not so good as always. And I was like failing a freshman class. I just, you know, the favoritism in, in, in the room just was so distracting. And then uh, I got to get to the tanning salon. I remember that day and I had my car and I, would get, I was going to get in the car and this little blonde girl comes behind me and said, hey, I was like, what do you want? And she's like, your dad's down on our floor if you want to come pick him up. He had too much to drink last night. I was like, who the fuck says that to somebody? Who in their right mind says that? So the mom went to the school, called her kid out of class to tell me my dad is dead. Without even calling anybody else. Like, what am I going to do about it, lady? And so then the guy, she was with her boyfriend or something, drove me over to the house, was right up the block from my mom's. And some girl's just a junkie, a pill-popping, whatever, bar slut. I don't know her name. And, yeah, basically just took everything she needed out of his wallet, and, you know, he was dead. And I was so upset at the way I was told he was dead, I didn't want to even identify the body. At this, at this point, I'm just in shock, because this is all just, you know, blindsiding me. And I was just going to go work at the tanning salon, and I'm being told that my father is, is just dead and not coming back. But not only that, he's been laying on the floor for about, you know, 18 hours. Nobody checked on him. So uh, he just asphyxiated on his vomit. And so I said, hey, Mom, why don't you come to the hospital? Because, you know, I was just told Dad is dead, and I'm not going to identify the body, you know, because he's not, you know, wearing any clothes, whatever, blah, blah, blah. No, no, he's not. He's at the post office. I saw him the other day. He's fine. Let's not over-exaggerate. I said, no, um, he's dead, Mom. Like, uh, checked out, as in, like, not coming back, as in, like, lights out. Dead? And she got all, I'll never forget her screech. It was just, like, not even human across from the phone. And then there was an odd sound. She goes, I'll be right there. So she hung up the phone, and I left there, and I went home, and, you know, I just had such a bad stomach ache. I just couldn't even do anything with myself the rest of the night. I was just sick to my stomach. And um, then we got papers after my dad was, you know, dead and stuff in the funeral. And, you know, they just kind of passed me from my classes. I don't even think they gave me a hard time. I couldn't focus on anything anyway. And I was taking care of him. I was going over there, giving him anxiety pills. He actually was drinking so much. He had cirrhosis of the liver. And he was lo losing his mind because he was drinking so much alcohol all the time. He was just in really bad shape. And I felt so bad for him. So to kind of take care of him like a child. I was the only one that would care for him with his million friends, right? That loved him and cared about him. And he, he didn't even really ask me hardly, but he didn't want to ask anybody else because, see, he was always treated like a burden, I think, at his house with his parents also. So that was his inner wound. So anyway, I felt the need to do that for him, and I was the closest to him when he died. Anyway, on Adderall, you didn't feel that much, so thank God I had that as a crutch, but now I deal with all of it anyway, so it doesn't matter. You deal with things now or later. And so, anyway... Going along in my childhood, after that was painful, um, 
you know, my mom actually had a sign over his house to her and said, oh, you girls can collect the rent. It's a piece of real estate, blah, blah, blah. She already had two or three at this time. You know, that's where all of her money went besides her figurines and clothes and all the stuff for herself. You know, like very little for us girls to just wear hand-me-downs, go to Goodwill, you know, Lunchables and uh, peanut butter and jelly sandwich every day. Got really old and then, you know, kind of noodles and hot dogs for dinner. Uh, but, you know... I guess you could say she did the best she can. She did what she had to to get by. You know, I don't think she did the best she can. I don't buy it. So, you know, and even in high school, we had to buy our own tampons, our own pads, or take them from other people. She never would allow us to have any kind of feminine um, hygiene or, you know, just things we would need for our period as we were getting older. She just made it seem like, get a job and pay for your own stuff. I'm not buying that stuff for you. Be responsible. You're moving out when you're 18 anyway. She'd never let you forget it. So anyway, you know, being treated like that for, for so long just, you know, takes a toll on anybody's brain and their sanity. But, you know, nonetheless, uh, you know, parents install uh, suicidal patterns in their children at young ages. And I, I did get to a point where I was suicidal, even, you know, on medication. And I think that's when she changed it and blamed the medication and not her bad parenting. But, I mean, she put me anywhere just to avoid me you know, counselor's offices, uh, beyond parental control unit for juvenile delinquents that I didn't belong at, um, saying that I was a troublemaker and on drugs and I wasn't, and they looked at her like she was crazy. Come get your kid. Um, you know, go to the park and play, uh, you know, join this activity after school if it's free. Um, get a ride with your friends. I mean, just constantly go wash your clothes at his house. Go eat over there. Go eat their food. You know, it's just always somewhere else to go and something else to do anywhere but with her around her using her resources or her being a parent is not what she wanted to be but anyway um this video is getting kind of long i'm gonna cut it off in a minute but that's my childhood in a nutshell um basically had to tell people where i was coming from so you'd understand uh and then i'll i'll continue with part two at a later time um, I appreciate you guys for listening to me. This is very hard for me to get out into the open. I don't talk much about my past with people and I don't open up easy. So thanks for listening.